Well, let's get started. Uh, this morning we're going to talk about the von Neumann architecture, which is the way computers are designed from the time von Neumann suggested it in 1947 until now. <clears throat> but first, I was a little bit mysterious when I talked about that edge-triggered latch. Um, and I didn't, I didn't want to be mysterious, so here's a picture of one. You can completely forget about this, okay? Um, but what I wanted to show you is that it's not anything mysterious. If you printed this slide and then traced through the paths of those NOR gates, you could convince yourself that that, in fact, passes whatever is on the D data input to the Q output when the clock signal changes. Not when it's high or when it's low, but when it changes from one to the other. This one, I think, and yes, I haven't studied it. This one, I think, is a negative edge triggered latch, so it would change the output when the clock changes from high to low. You do not need to do anything with this. I just didn't want to be mysterious about it. Anybody have any questions about that? Oh, I told you that we, that these things depended on the gate delay through a not gate, and this one doesn't do that. This one depends on the gate delay um, from the two middle NOR gates. I couldn't find the diagram of the one that um, depends on the delay through a not gate. I sort of cleared out my books when I retired and emptied out my office. John von Neumann um, is, was, he died in 1955, I think, a Hungarian-American mathematical physicist. Uh, and during World War II, he was working on the hydrodynamic equations of the hydrogen bomb. Um, the atomic bomb had, was under underway um, elsewhere in the Manhattan Project. Von Neumann was working on the next step. He made many contributions to mathematics, to physics, and to game theory. Um, he may have been the smartest person to live in the 20th century, and if he wasn't, he's in the top five. Uh, somebody once gave him the problem of the two colliding trains and the fly flying between them. And how far does the fly travel before the trains collide and crush the fly? And he answered that instantly. And the person who gave him the riddle said, gee, most mathematicians try to do that the hard way. Von Neumann said, what's the easy way? Oops. Um, his book, and it's 47 pages printed, and you can buy a copy on Amazon, although you shouldn't. There's better uses for money. If you're going to spend money on books on Amazon, buy my book, because I get a cut of it. Um, but you can also find First Draft online. That was, it was published by the Army Corps of Engineers, I think, um, wherever Hermann Goldstein was working. And he published it with only von Neumann's name on it, but it has a contributions from a number of scientists and engineers of the time. It describes how computers are designed ever since 1947 up until now. The design laid out in that little book is called the von Neumann architecture. So we're going to, to look at some simple circuits. In particular, on Tuesday, we're going to design a small arithmetic logic unit. The reason that we get such complex results out of computers, even though they can perform only a few operations, is that they can perform those operations very fast. My own example of simplicity and complexity is coming up next. Um, the complex things that computers can do. And by golly, we're recording my lecture, including recording 
images of these slides. Uh, they will be available to you later today. I have an errand to run right after class, so it's likely to be this evening. Um, that, that is a hugely complex task, but all of the things involved in that task are built out of the few hundred simple operations that computers can do. And we see them, we, we see the results quickly because modern computers are very fast. Different computer architectures, different computer designs have different operations. They are not all the same. Um, anybody who has tried to run a Windows program on a Mac computer has found that out. Now there are ways to simulate a Mac on Windows and there's probably a way to simulate Windows on a Mac, but you can't just plug Windows code into a Mac processor and have it work. The set of operations that a particular computer can perform is called its instruction set. And we're going to see today a computer with an instruction set of nine operations that can nonetheless actually do stuff. So this is my, my example of simplicity and complexity. The, the dial phone that was around in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, there is behind that dial a wheel with a cam and it opens and closes contacts. How many times it opens and closes the contact is determined by which number you spin around on the wheel. And so spinning the seven number around to the finger stop will generate seven pulses. And equipment in the telephone central office can count those pulses and eventually connect you with whoever you're trying to call. So we had talked about mental models. One mental model of computing was the one we saw where we looked at the pieces, the mouse and the display and the keyboard and so on. The mental model we are gonna concentrate on for the next several classes is how the CPU processes data. So instructions, which are binary numbers, data, also binary numbers, main memory, computation, input and output, and a way of controlling program flow, doing things like looping or making decisions with it if, then, and else. The features of the von Neumann architecture are several. One of them was the stored program concept. I think on the very first day I mentioned that prior to von Neumann's first draft little book, computers were programmed by rewiring them. That was a tedious job that took hours. And von Neumann said, well, you know what? Those connections can be represented by binary numbers. And that means we can store the program in the same memory that holds the data. And now once a program is written, it can be loaded into memory in seconds. Now it takes even less than seconds because we have faster computers and faster memories. Von Neumann also described this thing that is, is perfectly reasonable to us. And we look at it and we say, well, yeah, that's how you should do that. Sequential execution of instructions. Instructions get executed in order one after another. Um, prior to von Neumann's first draft, people tried to build computers that could do many things in parallel because the electronic circuits of the time were relatively slow. So if I can parallelize stuff, I can make a faster computer. It turns out that there's a huge amount of complexity in doing that. And von Neumann said, do one thing at a time and we get rid of all that complexity. Um, von Neumann described this thing that we're going to call the instruction cycle. And it is fetch an instruction from memory into the CPU decode the instruction. The instruction is a binary number and the CPU needs to decode. And I'm, I'm sort of anthropomorphizing the CPU. We're going to anthropomorphize it a little bit more a little bit later in the class. But when I say the CPU needs to decode so it knows what the instruction means, that's just combinational logic circuits 
like we've already done. We're going to feed some number of bits that is the binary number of the instruction into combinational logic and the right circuits to perform that instruction are going to get enabled. Um, so that, that is decode. And the last one is execute the instruction, that is do what it says. Von Neumann also de um, described the use of binary numbers in computing. Engineers were already using binary circuits. I think I showed you a picture of a ring counter from ENIAC um, on maybe the second day of class with a whole bunch of vacuum tubes. And that ring counter used 10 vacuum tubes to represent one decimal digit. It's very hard to determine exactly the value of a variable signal in an electronic circuit. But it's pretty easy to reliably determine whether it's on or off. And von Neumann said, well, you know, you got these 10 vacuum tubes for one decimal digit. You could count from 0 to 1023 if you use them for binary numbers. And I think some of the engineers of the time may have said, well, duh, because uh, it was a brand new idea. Now, von Neumann did not invent binary numbers. They had been around for a long time. It was von Neumann who said, we can improve the expressive power of our binary circuits if we use binary numbers. Uh, von Neumann's design of the EDVAC had a separate CPU memory and input and output. Um, before that, computers were sort of monolithic. Everything was one module and it all had to work just right and together. Just as modular programming makes programming easier, modular design and construction made building a computer easier. So the organization that von Neumann proposed and that we can find in today's computer looks like this. There is that thing that we call a central processing unit, and it has three parts, a control unit, an arithmetic logic unit, and some number of registers. And then memory is separate and communicates with the CPU, and input and output are separate operations. Because von Neumann uh, described a computer in which both data and instructions are stored in memory, the connection to memory between the CPU and memory is used for both data and instructions, and that's called the von Neumann bottleneck. Sometimes we're loading an instruction, and when we're doing that, we can't load data. Alternatively, if we are loading data, we can't load the next instruction. So how do we deal with that? We'll talk about cache memory when we talk about modern computer organization um, a little bit later. We put some, some memory on the CPU chip itself. It turns out that when a computer program is executing, in general, only a small part of the code is needed at any given instant. Um, and um, we can make a split cache, one that holds data on one, in one place and, a, and holds instructions in another, or we can do an entirely split memory, something called the Harvard architecture has two memories and two sets of connections between the CPU and memory, one for data and one for instructions. The trouble is that although that sort of gets rid of the von Neumann bottleneck, what if I need very few instructions and a whole bunch of data? I can't do it. Or if I need a whole bunch of instructions and very little data, I can't do that either. With the von Neumann architecture, as long as instructions and data together will fit in the single, in that one memory, then everything is happy. Okay, the instruction cycle we've already said was fetch, decode, and execute. The fetch part involves reading an instruction from memory and getting it into the CPU. Deco the decode part can be done in one of two ways. We can build combinational logic that takes the bits from the instruction and activates the necessary circuits. Or we can do this thing called microprogramming, where 
a, a small bit of combinational logic actually decodes the instruction in the same way you would decode it if you wrote, a, a, say, a Java program to do that. And then execute the decoded instruction. The, that instruction cycle of fetch, decode, and execute runs repeatedly for as long as the computer is running. You may have noticed that um, you can see an idle indicator or an indicator of how much CPU time a computer is using in some circumstances. You can see that when you bring up the task manager in Windows, for example. What's happening is if the operating system doesn't have any actual work to do, it runs something called an idle loop. And by measuring how, how much the idle loop is running, it's possible to compute the load on the CPU of doing actual work. So we looked at registers last time. Registers are fall, small, fast storage within the CPU. A modern CPU is likely to have a few hundred registers. The Intel 8008, which started all of, of everything that is Microsoft and x86, had something like 16 registers. We're going to design a computer that has five of them, only one of which can actually be used for data. So from a few registers to a few hundred registers. Um, Registers can have either one, what, well, I'm sorry, registers can have one input and either one or two, or they could have more outputs. We're going to see registers that have one and two outputs. Conceptually, what's in the register is the right number of latches. We looked at latches last time. Um, there are some economies of scale when you were building 64 of those for a 64-bit 64-bit uh, register, but conceptually it's 64 of those latches. Um, the capacity of a register is from a few bits to 64 or even 128 bits. Our, the registers in the computer we're going to design are mostly 12-bit registers. And I told you last time that fat arrows indicate multi-bit paths. And if we need to know how many bits in a multi-bit path, we'll put a slash across the fat arrow and write a number down there. If we don't care how many, we can abstract that away. The von Neumann architecture needs at least five registers. These are the ones we're going to have in the design that comes out of this class. The memory address register and I'm, I'm going to talk about each of these separately in just a minute. The memory data register, either data registers or an accumulator. If there's more than one register that can receive the results, I'm sorry, if there's more than one register that can receive the results of arithmetic operations, they're called data registers. If there's only one, it's called an accumulator. A program counter, and remember, one, two, three, the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. There is a very famous computer architecture book that gets that wrong. But as we look at how a computer has to work, it will become obvious that the program counter must hold the address of the next instruction. The instruction register holds the instruction itself. It's a binary number. We want to be able to examine the bits to decode the instruction and the instruction register gets that instruction into the CPU so we can do stuff with it. The memory address register holds an address of a memory location. So if I had a 4096 byte memory I would need 12 bits of memory address register and it could address one of those 4,096 bytes. The memory address register serves two purposes. It holds the address from which to read when we're reading from memory and the address to which to write when we're writing to memory. The memory data register holds information that is transferred either from or to memory. 
since we have both data and instruction words in memory, the memory data register can hold either a word of data or a word of instruction. And that one is also used when we are reading from memory and writing to memory. Data registers or the accumulator are the registers that can receive the results of arithmetic and logic operations. If there's only one of them, it's called an accumulator. Uh, modern computers tend to have somewhere between 16 and 32. RISC computers tend to have many more, 64 or even 128. Uh, lots of registers, and we'll talk about that when we talk about modern computer architecture a little later in the course. The original von Neumann architecture had only one data register, and when there is only one, it's called an accumulator. The program counter holds the address of the next instruction, and it gets updated very shortly after an instruction is fetched, so that it always points to the next instruction. There's one brief moment in there when it's pointing to the current instruction, but that brief moment doesn't last long at all. The program counter can be changed by the CPU, and that's how branching works. When you call a method or a procedure, the program counter has to be changed. Um, when you do an if-then-else, the program counter has to be changed, and the CPU can do that. The instruction register holds the actual instruction bits that were fetched from memory, and uh, having the instruction bits in the CPU is necessary in order to decode that instruction um, and provides the, the information necessary to execute the instruction. Often instructions need to not only specify what the, the CPU should do, but also specify the data that should get operated on. The arithmetic and logic unit performs as you might expect, arithmetic and logic. Okay, this, this is an easy one. Um, that is one of the gimme questions that is likely to be on the test. What does the arithmetic logic unit do? Performs arithmetic and logic. Uh, I don't write very many of those questions, but it's always good to have one or two of them, okay? Um, so arithmetic operations like addition or logical operations like complementation or comparison. The arithmetic and logic unit can be used to transfer data both within the CPU and from the CPU to the input and output subsystem. The control unit controls the processing of instructions and it does that by generating control signals that select one operation of the ALU. We'll, we're going to see some detail about that on Tuesday. Uh, it also has to generate the control signals to store the result. When we looked at latches, remember there was an enable line on, on the latch. The control unit has to generate the proper enable signals to store data, has to generate the proper outputs um, to, to select the data to go through the ALU. We'll see some pictures in a minute. Um, memory, that's the thing we call RAM or random access memory. It's also called main memory or primary storage. Um, the memory locations are of fixed size. In a modern computer, those memory locations are 8-bit bytes although we're going to find out when we get to modern computers that typically transfers happen in, in units of more than one byte. So if I have a computer with a 64-bit word, we're going to transfer eight bytes at a time between the CPU and the memory. All right, I've said all of that. Uh, bytes are eight bits, also called octets, and the instructions in machine language and the data necessary for running a program are held in that main memory. Now, when one is designing a computer, 
the sizes of certain key items specify the maxima for the computer design. And I'll give you an example. For a 32-bit computer, of which there are very few left anymore, um, a 32-bit program counter or address register cannot address more than two to the 32 items, so about four billion. Now, that would be four gigabytes of memory if we had a byte addressable memory and a 32-bit memory address register. If I have a 16-bit signed integer, the only numbers I can store are between minus 32,768 to plus 32,767. Uh, and um, I think I told you about an Ariane rocket being dis destroyed because someone tried to store a large floating point number in an integer that wasn't big enough. You're going to find this in every part of hardware and software design. Memory can hold both data and instructions. The instruction consists of an operation code and one or more operands. The operation code is nothing more than a number. It's a binary number, but it's just a number. And the design of the computer assigns meaning to each of those numbers. The operands are the data that um, they either give the location of the data or they contain the data. So the op code tells the computer, tells the CPU what to do, and the operands describe the data that should be used for whatever the instruction is, whatever the operation is. They're all binary numbers. Everything inside a computer is a binary number. Okay. Instructions can be of either fixed length or variable length. Um, there are some problems with variable length instructions, but the Intel x86 architecture has variable length instructions. It's, the problems are not at all insurmountable. Okay. The, operation code and the operands, I've said this about a dozen times today, are binary numbers. The size of each part is important. That is the number of bits in each part. If you think about it, if I have a six bit operation code, how many different values, uh, different combinations of six bits are there? Hint, the answer is on the slide. 64. And so I can only have 64 distinct operations. Often we don't need as many as 64, but um, many modern computers have a lot more than 64. A four bit address register field, that's an operand, means I can't have any more than two to the fourth or 16 registers. I mentioned earlier that different computer families have different instruction sets. The instruction set architecture of a computer family tells the operations that can be performed, the format of the instructions, and the formats of data. And different computer families can have different instruction set architecture. Beginning with IBM's System 360, computer families are made backward compatible. That means that new instructions might be added to an instruction set architecture, but all the old ones are kept. So I can make things more modern, but the old programs will still work. That is important in the 21st century because computers have become cheap and manpower, person power, has become expensive. So rewriting programs is not something anybody wants to do. I talked to a man who is a high head honcho for a federal contractor. And they have millions of lines of programs 
written in the COBOL language and running on an IBM mainframe. They would like to run these programs on um, server class machines rather than on mainframe class machines, but the amount of manpower that it would take to rewrite the programs is prohibitive. Okay, so the instruction set architecture describes the operations that a computer can perform in the formats of the data and the instructions. The micro architecture is different. It's the implementation. The instruction set architecture describes what a computer can do. The micro architecture t describes how that's accomplished. So given a particular instruction set architecture, it is highly possible that it could be accomplished with more, more than, in more than one way. Come on, mouth, do your stuff. Um, am I going too fast? I think I get a yes out of, out of that. Um, okay, let me see if I can slow down a little bit. How are we doing for time? I'm going at just about the right speed for what we've got. Okay, for an example, there are two ways to design a control unit. One of them is hardwired. We build a, out of gates something that takes the bits of the instruction code, the operation code, and generates the necessary control signals. The other way is a microprogrammed control unit that is actually a sort of minimally programmable computer itself that generates the same control signals. The end result is the same, but the mechanism for generating the signals is different. It turns out that hardwired control units are both faster and more expensive than microprogrammed control units. Let us introduce this thing called the Little Man Computer. The Little Man Computer has been around since 1965. Stuart Madnick is a business school professor at MIT, and he devised the Little Man Computer to teach computing to B-school students. Um, it's actually a kind of an interesting thing. While I was thinking about writing the thing that is now your textbook, Dr. Bob Harbert, who is an emeritus professor of computer science, said, well, you just make sure that students who take that class don't leave it believing there are a bunch of little Martians with calculators inside the computer. So we're going to see a Martian before this is all over. But there are no Martians with calculators inside real computers, okay? The little man computer imagines a computer as a room, and inside the room there's a calculator, some in and out baskets for I.O., some mailboxes for storage, and a program counter, and a little man that makes all of that stuff work. So let's look at Madnick's idea, and there is the Martian. Um, the Martian came from a faculty member in the, in the School of Art up at the Kennesaw campus. So we've got in and out baskets, a calculator, mailboxes, and there are a hundred of them numbered zero to 99. I couldn't fit a hundred on the slide. And the program counter and the Martian, the little man. The calculator stands in for the arithmetic logic unit of a real computer. In and out baskets are input and output, just like you might expect. Um, the little man is both control unit and interface. The memory, those are the mailboxes, and the numbers there are only labels. The program counter is a counter all by itself. The little man computer is a von Neumann architecture computer. Now, the B-School students start with the little man computer. We started with Boolean algebra and digital logic gates, and that's what makes us not be B-School students. Y'all are going to understand when you leave here 
at a conceptual level how all of these pieces fit together and why we don't need little Martians inside the computers. And Dr. Herbert and I both think that that's a good thing. Okay, the calculator has only three digits. So we're talking about the word size of the machine. It's three decimal digits. It can display a minus sign, so I can have plus or minus 999. There is no way for entering negative numbers. If I need a negative number, I'm going to have to subtract to get it. Um, there is no memory in the calculator other than what's being displayed. The display serves as a one-word memory. The calculator can perform three operations. Entry, that is, we clear out the display and put something in it. Um, and it's going to stay there until it has changed. Addition, we type in a number and it is added to what's already there. Or subtraction, we type in a number and it's subtracted from. Okay. The memory has addresses 0, 0 to 99, so there are 100 memory locations. Each Mailbox can hold one and only one slip of paper. That's the data word. The words are three decimal digits, and they may be either instructions or data. So we have at address 49 there, I have a contents of 199. That could be either an instruction or data. The memory does not know whether that is an instruction or a data or data. The program counter has two digits. It can be advanced by the little man by one unit. The little man can also set it to an arbitrary two-digit number, and it can be reset to zero from the outside. There are an in-basket and an out-basket limited to slips of paper with three-digit numbers, and only one at a time. So if a second input shows up in that in-basket, what was already there is lost. The little man is both the control unit and the interface. And he can do one of a number of things. Operate the calculator, read and update memory, get data from the input basket or put data to the output basket, read, advance, and set the program counter. The little man knows that most 10 commands, because we're going to use one decimal digit, uh, is the operation code. So, a memory word can be either a three-digit number, and that's data, or a one-digit number and a separate two-digit number. Either way, depends on how you look at it. If the program counter points to a memory word, we assume that that memory word is an instruction with a one-digit operation code and a two-digit operand address. Together, the operation code and the address are an instruction. So interpreting the instruction is instruction decoding. It's the decode part of that fetch, decode, and execute. If the program counter contains a 50 and memory looks like that, well, if the program counter points to a memory location, the contents of the memory location are assumed to be an instruction. And the instruction has a one-digit operation code and a two-digit operand. So because we know the program counter contains a 50, that 325 is an operation code and an operand that is 25. So the operation code is a command to the little man. The 25, that's a mailbox number or a memory address, depending on how you look at it. The command, 3, whatever 3 means, and we'll get to that in a minute, will use the specified memory address when it performs the operation. So we're looking at that 325 this way. One digit of operation code and two digits of address. It turns out that opcode 3 is the store instruction. How did that happen? Stuart Madnick decided that it would be in 1965. 
Um, it turns out that one is add, two is load, three is store. He probably wrote instructions down in the order that he thought of them. Uh, but just because he decided three to be store, that's why. The store instruction stores the contents of the calculator, the thing that is displayed in the calculator window, to the specified memory address. So 325 means store, that's the three, the number displayed by the calculator in mailbox 25. We could have selected a different memory location by having a different number other than 25 in that instruction. Okay, so what happens is the little man reads the number on the calculator, writes it on a slip of paper, places the paper in the mailbox named by the address, in this case mailbox 25. The previous contents of the mailbox are destroyed. So you can think of, a, of a, the mailbox as having an open back, and we push this new slip of paper in, the old one falls out and lands on the floor. Each memory location can hold only one value at a time, and when we store a new value, the old value is destroyed. However, the number displayed by the calculator is unchanged. So we can say that writing is destructive. The previous value is gone. Reading is non-destructive. Okay, so here is the LMC instruction set. We're only interested in the operation codes. It turns out that opcode 4 is not used. Um, 0 is halt. 1 is add, 2 is subtract, I got those wrong a minute ago, 3 is store, 5 is load, 6 is branch, unconditionally branch, 7 is branch if 0, and in that case we look at the, we the little Martian, looks at the calculator, and if it's a 0, we're going to take the branch, that is go to a different location. If it's non-zero, the branch is not taken. Um, opcode 8 is branch on positive, same sort of thing. 901 is read what's in the input basket and type it into the calculator. 9 is the I.O. operation. It is both input and output. And the address part, 01 or 02, tells us whether it's input or output. So 902 Whatever's in the calculator is written on a slip of paper and placed in the outbasket. Calculator is unchanged. If there was other, if there was other data in the outbasket, it is destroyed. Okay, that's the B-School introduction to computers in one class session. In fact, in about half a class section. This is, this is what our brothers in the business school learn. Let's look at a simple program. Remember 9 is the input and output operation and 0, 1 means input. So 9, 0, 1 means get a number. 3 is store and our mailbox number is 99. So the first number that was input is stored at location 99. 901 again input another number. 1 is add. Add the contents of mailbox 99 to what was in the calculator. The input put something in the calculator. So after that add, the display of the calculator will have changed. The add was destructive, but the contents of mailbox 99 will still be there. 902 output from the calculator. We've added two numbers and now we output them. Halt, stop doing anything. And at 99, we have something of, of unknown value that's going to be used for data storage. Okay. And you know what? I got ahead of myself. I have all of this highlighting stuff that I just forgot was there so that you could see the line I was talking about while I talked about it. Sorry. Everybody followed along with me anyway, right? Good. 
Okay, a couple of things to notice. The little man, the Martian, does not need to be intelligent. He does one of a very few things. Read the memory location pointed by the program counter, advance the program counter, perform one of a very few operations, and they are indicated by that operation code. Separate equipment like the calculator does the real work, and each of those steps is repeated for each instruction. So the little man doesn't do very much. Three things repeatedly. Fetch, get an instruction from memory. And the fetch operation works like this. The little man looks at the program counter, remembers the address, and fetches a three-digit instruction from that address. All right. The contents of the address are unchanged. Um, and here it is. After fetching the instruction from memory, the program counter is advanced by one. Now it points to the next instruction in memory. So there was a very brief moment there when the program, at the beginning of fetch, when the program counter pointed to the current instruction, except it was really kind of the next instruction then too, because we were just leaving the instruction before it. The little man looks at the operation code and uses that table that we saw a moment ago to determine um, what operation and looks at the two digit operand to determine what data and then execute do what the operation code says. So around and around and around fetch decode and execute. So three control structures are sufficient for all correct programs. This is the structured program theorem. It was proven by a couple of Italian computer scientists, Bohm and Jacopini, in 1966. Um, man, I was a freshman in college in 1966. That was a long time ago. Um, Bohm and Jacopini said the three control structures that you need are sequence, that's do one instruction after another, and you are used to that when you write a program, this line gets executed, and then unless it's something like a procedure call, the line after it gets executed. Selection, if then else, um, and iteration, loops that repeat. If you have those three things, uh, they are sufficient for all correct programs. The program counter automatically gives us sequence. If we fetch from the address pointed by the program counter and advance the program counter, if nothing else intervenes, the next instruction will be the one now pointed by the program counter. So we'll go one after another. Uh, branch instructions, operation code six, the unconditional branch, causes the little man to take the two digit address part of the instruction and essentially jam it into the program counter. So if the address part of the instruction were a 50, the next instruction would be fetched from location 50. And I just said all of that because I got ahead of myself. Um, there are also conditional branches. There's a branch zero and a branch positive. Branch zero branches if the calculator holds only a zero and branch positive branches if the calculator holds a positive number. We can implement both selection, that is if then else, and iteration, that is looping, using branch instructions. So here's an example. Location 50 contains a 675. Six was that unconditional branch. No, you do not have to memorize these operation codes. Okay. Um, Six was that unconditional branch, and the address field, the operand field, is a 75. 
So what that says is the next instruction should be fetched from location 75. Maybe we have a method or a procedure there. The little man fetches the instruction from location 50 and advances the program counter. Now it points to 51. And then during the execute phase of the instruction cycle, the little man changes the program counter to 75. And now, when, we, when the next fetch takes place, the instruction will be fetched from location 75. That's kind of a key concept of how computers really work. Why did the little man advance the program counter um, right after fetching the instruction? That's the only place in the sequence where you can do that. If I did it right after the execute, I'd change the 75 to a 76, and that's wrong. Advancing the program counter has to be immediately after the fetch and before we start doing anything with the instruction. Okay, in a real computer, the program gets advanced during the fetch or decode, just like we just said, before the execute, because the execute part might change the program counter. And if I mess with it after the execute part, I have messed up that change. So the program counter always points to the next instruction. Now, I absolutely guarantee you that is on the exam that's coming up on the 15th. I absolutely guarantee it. So remember our chant, the program counter holds the address of the next instruction. Let's do that. The program counter, come on y'all, holds the address of the next instruction. Okay, I told you you didn't have to memorize those operation codes, even though there's only like nine of them. It is tedious with nine of them. And if there are 300 and something as there currently are in the x86 instruction set, it changes from tedious to impossible, okay? So here's a, a, maybe a new word for some of you, mnemonic, the M is silent. Um, it, it is pronounced like it starts with an N and it means an aid to memory. And we are going to assign instruction mnemonics, abbreviations that replace those numeric operation codes. And here they are, um, HLT, these are all three character abbreviations, is HALT, then we have ADD, SUB for subtract, STO for store, LDA, load the calculator, um, BRA for the unconditional branch, BR0 for branch of zero, BRP for branch positive, and input, um, in basket to calculator is an INP, out is calculator to out basket. You don't need to memorize those either, but you might be asked to read a program that is written in those mnemonics, and you will be asked to write a program in your homework. You will be asked to write a program for the little man computer, actually something we're gonna call the tiny binary computer. There are thousands of little man computer programs on the internet. No matter which one I might suggest that you write, you can probably find it already done for you. Please don't do that. Um, you are once again cheating yourselves out of the opportunity to learn how these pieces fit together. Um, I told you Tuesday that I hate, loathe, despise, and abominate marking homework. In a perfect world, I would not give homework. I really like teaching the professional development classes because there's no homework and no grades. I don't have to do anything except this part of the class, and this is the fun part. For you, if I don't give you homework, I have cheated you. I've cheated you out of that opportunity to rehearse what you were learning. And so I put up with marking the homework even though I hate, loathe, despise, and abominate it. 
a, a kind of program is called an assembler. The assembler is a computer program and its job is to read those instruction mnemonics like add and sub and stow. That's the source program. And output the same program but with the instruction mnemonics translated to the numeric operation codes. The assembler reads something that is relatively reasonable for humans to write and turns it into something that the computer can use. Assemblers also give us a way to provide symbolic names for memory locations so we can name our data um, instead of having to remember that we put that input number at location 99, we can name it something. Uh, the assembler is the very simplest language translator. There are, there are other kinds of language translators and we'll talk to them when we get to chapter six, we'll talk about them when we get to chapter six and talk about software. But the assembler is the very simplest language translator. Um, the LMC assembler, I might have to start calling that the little Martian computer. Um, the LMC assembler recognizes the DAT mnemonic for data and uses it to reserve one empty instruction word. Um, and so we can reserve a location for data and we can give it a name. Um, these are called pseudo instructions. They, you write them like an instruction, but they're never executed by the CPU. Um, we can, with the little Martian computer and real assemblers, also initialize data. So I could say DAT001, and the assembler would find a memory location and load a 001 into it. So, here is a program, um, the addition program, written in assembly language. Uh, we're still using a 99. We haven't, uh, you know, this needs a little bit of help. Uh, but never mind. Input, store, input again, add, um, out, output, halt, and then our data storage. And I'm going to change that before I put it on, before I post it. So have a look at it again. The change that I'm going to make is I'm going to get rid of those 99s and put a name on DAT in there just to, to emphasize that we can name storage locations. The LMC, the Little Martian Computer, is a decimal computer. All real computers are binary. All real general purpose digital computers are binary. There is a certain amount of magic in what the little man does. The little man knows things like memorizing the opcodes. Um, there is no magic in real computers. There are a bunch of little man simulators, but they don't really show the fetch decode execute cycle. They just essentially execute the program monolithically. So we're going to leave the little Martian computer behind and do something else beginning on Tuesday. So I have one other thing to talk about and that is bootstrapping. We have skimmed over how programs get into the computer and actually how the, how the computer gets started computers generally have a built-in program that can read another program from outside. That process is called bootstrapping. If you are like any one of us, if you are an IBM or it's called the initial program load or IPL, they mean the same thing. Um, some firmware that, that will start the operation of the operating system. Once the computer is bootstrapped, the externally loaded program, that will be the operating system, is responsible for loading any other needed programs. So 
for the standard Windows type desktop or laptop, there is some firmware that knows how to load the operating system loader off of disk. That firmware is built into the computer. The operating system loader knows how to load the operating system. And once the operating system is loaded, uh, you can then load and run other programs. We just sort of finessed all of that today. Thank you very much, gentlemen and, and one lady. And I will see all of you on Tuesday when we will invent our own CPU.